Welcome back, and we welcome our next pair of speakers, Bryn Geffert and Kathy Sapella. So let's consider Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, the second, fourth, and possibly eternal president of Russia. <laughs> Putin was born in 1952. He spent the first 33 years of his life in Soviet Russia, an atheistic state, and he spent the next six years of his life in East Germany, where he served as a KGB officer. And of course, East Germany at this time was another atheistic state. As an elementary school student, Putin joined the Soviet youth organization, the Young Pioneers, which taught its members that God is a myth and that religion is an evil, exploitative force. The Young Pioneer Handbook, in fact, stipulated that young pioneers were to create an atheist corner in their home that was to be populated with anti-religious pictures, poems, and sayings. These, these corners were designed to replace icon corners where families traditionally displayed pictures of saints, the mother of God, and Jesus Christ. Well, studying law in the early 1970s, this, by the way, is Putin studying law, at, at Leningrad State University, Putin joined the Communist Party, another atheistic, uncompromisingly atheistic organization. In 1975, at age 23, he joined the KGB, the organization that, together with its predecessors, arrested and killed somewhere between 14 million and 22 million Christians. So we should consider this biography when we consider the fact that in 2012, when Vladimir Putin was 59 years old and president of the Russian Federation, Patriarch Kirill, the Patriarch of Moscow, the supreme head of the Orthodox Church in Russia, declared that Putin was, and here I quote, a miracle of God. <laughs> so my question today is how did Patriarch Kirill decide that Vladimir Putin is a miracle of God? To answer that question, we have to understand how Patriarch Kirill understands the historical fate of the Russian Orthodox Church or what Kirill might call the fate of Holy Rus. So first, some very quick history. Until 1917, that is, until the fall of the Tsarist monarchy, Russia was a definitively and thoroughly orthodox country. 90% of Russian citizens participated at least once a year in the Holy Eucharist and in the Sacrament of Confession. Under its exceptionally devout Tsar, Nicholas II, Russia boasted some 50,000 parishes. Think about that, 50,000 parishes for a population of only about 26 million people. 1,000 monasteries and 60 seminaries. 22 years later, at the end of Stalin's terror, every monastery had been closed, every seminary had been closed, and the number of parishes had dropped from 50,000 to about 300. And as I noted before, I'm sorry, and during this period, some 85% of all priests, monks, and nuns were arrested. As I noted before, anywhere from 14 to 22 million Christians were killed. Now, Stalin did grant the church a reprieve of sorts during and after the Second World War. He reopened some parishes and some monasteries. But when Khrushchev took power, he renewed the war on the church with a new vigor. He again closed churches and monasteries and seminaries and he launched a flurry of anti-religious propaganda. During Khrushchev's years, as many as 50,000 priests were killed, and the number of laity killed was certainly higher. The church moldered under Brezhnev and Brezhnev's successors. Its ranks were entirely infiltrated by the KGB. In the final decades of the Soviet Union, the Russian Orthodox Church was corrupt, ineffective, I think we can say firmly in the pocket of the Soviet state, and widely reviled by the majority of the populace. Just before the fall of the Soviet Union, only 30% of Russian citizens identified themselves as Orthodox. Now, before the Russian Revolution, before the rise of the Soviet state, that is during the imperial era, up until 1917, were problematic times for the church as well. Peter the Great, the great crusading westernizing czar of the 1700s was deeply suspicious of an independent church governed by an independent patriarch. Russian patriarchs had enjoyed an intermittently successful history of sparring with Russian czars. And when Adrian, patriarch of Moscow, died in 1700, Peter saw his chance to end this cycle. He simply refused to appoint a new patriarch. To govern the church, 
Peter instead established what he called an ecclesiastical college overseen by a cabinet minister, making the Russian church, in effect, a government cabinet. Thus, from, 19, excuse me, from 1721 up until 1917, government ministers appointed by the Tsar ran church affairs. The church became, in a very literal sense, a department of state. Now, the church, for the most part, despised this arrangement. To be sure, it relished its status as the religion of the empire, and it only occasionally doubted the state's commitment to orthodoxy as the religion of the empire, but the church nevertheless disliked its subjugation to the state. So when the Tsarist government fell in February of 1917, the church convened a council to reconstitute itself as a self-reliant body, and it almost succeeded. In August of 1917, the council elected Russia's first patriarch since 1700, Patriarch Tikhon. Two months later, however, the Bolsheviks seized power, and they spent the next two days dismantling the church. So, when Patriarch Kirill reflects on this history, especially the history during the imperial period, he sees a deeply flawed model for church-state relations. And when he reflects on the, re excuse me, when he reflects on the history during the Soviet period, he of course sees a disastrous model for church-state relations. But Kirill does not draw the conclusions that many Westerners might draw when contemplating these two models. Russian history does not teach Kirill that church and state should keep their distance. He does not conclude that the Russian church should isolate itself from the Russian state. The notion of a wall of separation between church and state is, for Kirill, both figuratively and literally foreign. Rather than withdrawing from the state, the church should partner with the state to transform all of society. Kirill's patriarchate talks a great deal about the re-Christianization of Russia. This is a favorite term of his, re-Christianization of Russia, of infusing Russia with orthodox morals and orthodox aesthetics. To Creel's mind, a worthy state can legislate on behalf of the church and align federal policy with church values. Here, Creel harkens back to a Byzantine notion of symphonia, sometimes espoused by patriarchs and emperors during the Byzantine Empire. The principle of symphonia is quite simple. It says that church and state must complement and support each other in a common mission. In a symphonic relationship, the state supports the church's efforts to promulgate orthodox values in all aspects of the nation's life. In a symphonic relationship, the state does not threaten the church. Instead, the church instructs the faithful to support and even celebrate civil authorities when those authorities support the church's goals, namely the Christianization of Russian society. So with that in mind, Let's return to Vladimir Putin, the former young pioneer, the former member of the Communist Party, and the former KGB officer, whose memberships required him to denounce Christianity and to espouse atheism. Here is the head of state that Patriarch Kirill has identified as a gift of God, the man who is Kirill's partner in establishing symphonic relations between the Russian church and the Russian state. So why did Kirill choose Putin? Part of the answer is obvious. Putin is the card Kirill has been dealt. Kirill did not choose Putin. Boris Yeltsin chose Putin. And the Russian electorate subsequently has chosen Boris, um, Putin several times more in, what was Sergei's word? Events of an electoral type? OK. <laughs> the other part of the answer, though, is that while Putin, while far from an ideal partner, gives Kirill much of what he wants. He gives him favorable legislation. He ensures generous contributions to the church from oligarchs, and he ensures robust articulations of orthodox nationalism. Key here, I think, is Putin's nationalistic imagining of himself in Russia. Putin is a Russian nationalist to the core. Such an orientation does not necessarily represent a radical departure from his former work as a communist apparatchik. Ever since Stalin won his ideological battle with Leon Trotsky over whether Russian communism is Russian communism or whether it is international or non-state communism, Russian communism assumed overtly nationalistic overtones. 
when he abandoned communism, Putin certainly set aside many of its philosophic, social, and economic elements without ever abandoning entirely its nationalistic elements. And there's just no escaping the fact that orthodoxy has for centuries served as a central component, one could argue even the key component, of Russian national identity. So as a nationalist, Putin has no choice, I would argue, but to speak of Russia as an orthodox nation. As an anti-Westerner, Putin finds in orthodoxy a confession that frequently defines itself against the West, against Western Christianity, namely against Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. For Putin, Russia is not the West. The West is corrupt and weak. Likewise, Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy is not Western Christianity. Western Christianity is corrupt and weak. The West is secular and amoral. The East, under the other hand, is faithful and holy. Western Christianity and Western democracy and this type of thinking are fractious, chaotic, and in decline, while Russia and the Russian state and the Russian church are united, solid, and resurgent. In these formulations, at least, the interests of the Russian state and the Russian church might seem to align. Hence, in Putin's thinking, the church rightly and naturally blesses national interests, including military interests. This conflation of nation and religion is perhaps best glimpsed in a document years in the making and finally issued by the Russian Orthodox Church, or rather the Moscow Patriarchate, in the year 2000. It's titled The Basis of the Social Concept, and I'd like to read just a few excerpts to give you a flavor of the Patriarchate's understanding of proper church relationships. I'll start the quote. In all times, the church has called upon her children to love their homeland on earth and not to spare their lives to protect it if it was threatened. The Russian church on many occasions gave her blessing to the people for them to take part in liberation wars. Christian patriotism may be expressed with regard to a nation as an ethnic community and as a community of its citizens. The Orthodox Christian is called to love his fatherland. When a nation, civil or ethnic, fully represents a predominantly mono-confessional orthodox community, it can, in a certain sense, be regarded as one community of faith, an orthodox nation. Now, we know next to nothing about Putin's private faith. George W. Bush seems to have been unique in his ability to peer into Putin's soul. <laughs> But in Putin, Kirill has at least found a partner who, whatever he may or may not believe, espouses a vision that often aligns well with this social concept. That said, serious tensions exist between Putin and Kirill. In December of last year, for example, Putin made an appearance at the Moscow Bishops' Conference where he praised the church's support of the state. The Carnegie Moscow Center did a very interesting analysis of this speech, and the center noted that in Putin's speech, he spoke about the church primarily as a utilitarian instrument for the state, about the church's value to the state rather than the other way around. Kirill followed Putin with a speech, and that took a much different tact. He emphasized instead the importance of church independence, while referencing various negative state influences on the church throughout Russian history. So to be sure, both Putin and Kirill want a church-state alliance, but Kirill remains alert to the exploitative possibilities of that alliance. Now, Patriarch Kirill's ultimate goal remains the re-Christianization of Russian society. So I'd like to conclude by asking whether Kirill is succeeding. Is Russia again becoming a Christian nation, an Orthodox Christian nation? It seems to me there are at least three ways we could answer this question. The first is to ask how today's Russians view themselves. Do they identify as Orthodox Christians? The second is to measure their familiarity with and knowledge of Christianity. Do they understand what they profess? And the third is to observe their actions. Do they perform deeds that one might expect an Orthodox Christian to perform? So let's start with the first question. How do Russians today view themselves? In 2014, a Pew Research Center poll found that some 72% of Orthodox, excuse me, of all Russians identify as Orthodox Christians. Compare this 72% to 30% at the end of the Soviet era. 
the vast majority of Russians seem, again, to understand themselves primarily as Christians. But when you dig, things get a little stranger. Only 56% of Russians believe in God, <laughs> leaving researchers to ponder the 16% who are apparently atheistic Christians. <laughs> and while 72% of Russians now claim to be Christian, their Christianity is of a peculiar kind. Let me give you a few statistics. Only 1% of self-identified Russian Orthodox believers understand Church Slavonic the precursor of modern Russia in which many priests still conduct the liturgy. Only 3% to 5% regularly read the Bible. In fact, fewer than one in six even own a full copy of the Bible. About one in three believe in life after death. Only 9% say that they are familiar with the doctrine of the Trinity. And in fact, if you go outside of major metropolitan centers, roughly 0% can identify a church teaching about the Trinity. Only 7% say that they attend church weekly, and we can compare that with about 42% in the United States. So Russia has become again an orthodox state of sorts, a nation in which most residents identify themselves as orthodox. But its people do not, for the most part, either understand or practice orthodoxy as the church understands it. Putin, it seems, has harnessed orthodox identity in service to his nationalistic vision, but that identity remains something of a surface identity. Kirill's vision of re-Christianizing Russia, I submit, remains just that, a vision. For the time being, it seems that Putin may benefit more from the imagined symphonia than does Kirill. Thanks. Okay, it's nice to see fellow alums come back to campus. Um, I'm class of 83, and I am a student of Jane and Bill Taubman's, <laughs> and uh, currently a tenured member of the Russian department, talking about cultural continuity. Um, I titled my talk, Poets and Patriarchy, knowing that Brin had titled his Putin and the Patriarch. Um, and I have ended up thinking mostly about Pussy Riot, um, who are probably the most famous critics of the situation that Brin just described for us. Uh, I just want to check in. How many people know what, what who Pussy Riot is and have seen the video? Excellent. Okay. Um, so to begin with the topic of patriarchy, not the patriarch per se, but of patriarchy, um, the Orthodox Church being, I would say, a patriarchal institution. But again, my intention is to speak a little more broadly about Russia as a patriarchal society. And just to um, revisit the basics of that idea, it is a society in which men dominate in the political, social, and economic spheres and enjoy the power and privileges that flow from that position. These societies tend to enforce very clear, clearly defined gender roles and gender identities. And tomorrow we'll have another panel about the politics of LGBTQ communities in Russia. Um, but I'm going to focus more on feminism right now, again, obviously because of the uh, actions of Pussy Riot. Um, another thing that patriarchal societies do is place explicit controls on gendered bodies, um, especially women's bodies. And I wanted to cite one symbolic example. In 2014, the Russian Duma decided that synthetic underwear is bad for women's health. When I say synthetic underwear, I mean lingerie. As of July 1 of 2014, underwear made from synthetic lace can no longer be imported into, manufactured by, or sold within the Russian-dominated Eurasian Customs Union. Um, Many Russians themselves were a little baffled by this. They interviewed one woman Grish, named Grishkova who said, quote, she loves her lingerie and believes in freedom of choice when it comes to underwear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And the person who sets the tone, the patriarch in chief, of course, is Putin himself. Um, you've seen many images of a bare-chested Putin. Brynn had one as well. This one is a favorite because it's been cropped <laughs> in a particular way. Um, but I assure you, he is holding a fishing rod. Um, uh, the, the important thing to note here, of course, is that he's wearing an Orthodox cross. Um, now, uh, given this cultural situation, uh, there are, there are um, small pockets of opposition um, in the creative intelligentsia. Um, and um, I wanted to just show you um, s uh, an example before I reach Pussy Riot of um, a performance art group uh, named Vaina, which means war in Russian. Actually, the members of Pussy Riot were initially involved in this group, Vaina. Um, they engage in uh, actions in public places. Um, and this is their most famous action. Um, they performed it in Petersburg in June of 2010. And uh, I need to establish two contexts so you can get the full uh, kick out of watching this action. Uh, one is um, that Putin's career in the KGB is linked to Petersburg. Uh, that's where he really began his political career in the early 90s. The second context is um, that Petersburg is, of course, located on the river Neva, and the Neva is an important shipping lane, and so the bridges in the center of the city uh, are drawbridges. They, they have to rise at certain points in, in the night in order to allow um, the shipping to um, proceed. So I'm just going to show you a, uh, it's actually a, um, sort of a, a news clip produced by a, a Western group, um, uh, probably a group, although it claims to be a person, named Banksy, who some of you may know about, uh, a graffiti artist um, in England. Uh -huh. land of grand architecture, fine literature, and rampant police corruption. Our collective Vanya has spent the last five years showing that the police are not untouchable through a series of increasingly extreme performance art pieces. In 2010, Vanya hit upon the ideal canvas to send a message to the authorities a bridge in the middle of St. Petersburg. <laughs> Using decoys to distract security guards, they took just 53 seconds to pull off their action with a highly coordinated attack. <laughs> was raised for a passing boat was the extent of their handiwork revealed. They called the police, Dick held prisoner by the cops. When fully erect, it stood 65 metres high and pointed directly at the headquarters of the former KGB. <laughs> so there's uh, Putin's power base in Petersburg in the early 90s. Um, you know, we can discuss the meanings of this action, but I uh, choose to read it as a re really smart commentary on the patriarchal nature of this regime. Um, of course, the more some of you may have known about that action, the more famous action, of course, is the Pussy Riot action. Um, they performed it in the Church of Christ the Savior in Moscow. So we move from... Uh, Moscow, uh, I'm sorry, from Petersburg to Moscow. Brin gave you a bit of history of the Orthodox Church. 
this is a very important uh, piece of architecture in Russian Orthodoxy. Um, it was built in the 19th century. It took a long time for it to get built. It was initially conceived um, by Alexander I to celebrate the Russian victory over Napoleon. Um, it took 40 years to build. It was finally completed in 1882. Um, the most dramatic attack of the Soviets against uh, the church probably is the destruction of this church, the Church of Christ the Savior, in central Moscow in 1931 on Stalin's orders. And this is an image of the building collapsing. They placed explosives under it. Um, the first task of the church after the collapse of the Soviet Union was to rebuild the Church of Christ the Savior. And this is how it looks today. Um, and this is the site of this action that um, Pussy Riot engaged in. Um, they uh, entered this area of the uh, altar that is forbidden to women and performed as much as they could uh, a so-called punk prayer. They actually didn't really get to perform it. Those of you who have seen the video with music, that was produced after the fact. Um, so they, the, they were only there for about a minute and uh, did some dancing, some singing, but they were uh, kicked out of the church uh, fairly efficiently. Um, why did they choose to do, perform this action at this moment? Uh, there is important context. Uh, this was just... A few months after Medvedev, who was who, uh, won the election after Putin, right, um, in 2008, announced in fall of 2011 that Putin was going to run again, um, that Putin was going to be his successor. And this was actually, um, given the grim story that uh, Sergei told earlier, there was actually this moment in 2011 when there were massive street protests um, at the idea of Putin again assuming the presidency. So it was a time when there was a lot of um, anti-Putin energy, uh, at least in the, the major cities. So that might have emboldened Pussy Riot. Um, but the most immediate reason for their action was uh, the patriarch calling on Orthodox believers to vote for Putin. So he was campaigning for Putin. And this really was the main reason that they, um, that they uh, staged the punk prayer. Uh, so I wanted to show you some of the lyrics, both um, to show you uh, the direct attack on the patriarch Gunjayev, but also to show you that their critique is going beyond this issue of um, symphonia. Uh, I'll just read these for you. Virgin, and this isn't the whole prayer, this is the second half of it. Virgin Mary, Mother of God, become a feminist. Become a feminist. Become a feminist. Um, the the church's praise of rotten dictators, the cross-bearer procession of black limousines. A teacher preacher will meet you at school. Go to class. Bring him money. Patriarch Gunjev believes in Putin. Bitch, better believe in God instead. The belt of the virgin can't replace mass meetings. They had an, a, a ritual, a public ritual, where they carried the belt of the virgin around. Um, so there, it was very specific reference to recent... Um, recent uh, developments. Mary, mother of God, is with us in protest. And then the famous refrain, Virgin Mary, mother of God, put Putin away. Um, so uh, again, a very direct attack on the symphonia uh, merging of state and church. Uh, they were arrested. They spent five months in detention. The trial took place in the summer of 2012, and two of the three women got rather serious sentences, uh, which they did serve. Um, the full story is told by Masha Gessen, who, as you know, is uh, um, on the faculty for uh, a couple of years, teaching courses at Amherst College. She has many books, and this is her account of uh, 
the, the women's time in prison. Words will break cement. This is a quotation, actually, from Solzhenitsyn. Um, and and uh, I, I think it's relevant because um, I'm going to basically argue that this is a new um, a sort of neo-dissidence in Russian uh, culture, however different <laughs> Solzhenitsyn's personal style and, and his politics are from the style and politics of Pussy Riot. I just wanted to uh, show you some text from the trial because uh, the trial actually was a huge event. Uh, it became a platform for them to uh, explain their agenda and explain their values uh, which they do in an incredibly articulate way. Uh, in the interest of saving time, I won't read it all aloud, but here you have their critique of symphonia, basically. And then the broader point I want to make, uh, they explain that they needed to sing the punk prayer not on the street in front of the temple, but at the altar, because that, of course, was the most offensive aspect of the action, where it took place. It had to happen at the altar that is in a place where women are strictly forbidden. The fact is the church is promoting a very conservative worldview, patriarchal worldview, that does not fit into such values as freedom of choice, the formation of political gender or sexual identity, critical thinking, multiculturalism, or attention to contemporary culture. Now look at the way they're talking. Their vocabulary is taken straight out of a, a Western, humanistic, critical vocabulary, right? This is our vocabulary. So it's, it's very interesting to watch them. If you read uh, the trial transcript, which is available in uh, uh, a book published by a feminist collective translated into English, it's an amazing uh, non-encounter. They are trying to explain to Orthodox believers that they are not attacking the Orthodox Church. But all the witnesses called in during their trial, they were accused of felony hooliganism, which they kind of made up for the occasion. Um, all of the witnesses were believers who talked about how deeply their uh, sensibilities were offended. And you can really see that there is no way for dialogue, despite all of their efforts and their declared agenda to explain themselves and show their Russianness as well. They go to great lengths to uh, contextualize what they're doing in terms of a long history of Russian um, opposition. Um, they cite Dostoevsky, for example, as a precedent. Uh, I've already mentioned Solzhenitsyn. Uh, they cite Brodsky. They, uh, they cite absurdist Russian poets like Daniel Harms. Um, so they really are kind of resurrecting a tradition of dissidence, but they're doing it in an environment where Western values per se are non-Russian. So this is a very collapsed cultural situation. Historically, Russia, of course, um, was formed by adopting, responding to Western models, Western vocabularies. This begins most powerfully, of course, under Peter the Great. Um, but in this, in the contemporary environment, this strategy is a non-starter. Putin has, has very cannily um, created a cultural situation in which the, intel the creative intelligentsia and uh, uh, any anyone of progressive or liberal persuasion cannot be heard. That is, the very vocabulary they're using is simply not, um, it's, it, it has no force, it has no impact with this audience. And I just wanted to, that is the, uh, uh, a, a broad Russian audience. I just wanted to end by quoting some uh, lines from a poet, Yelena Fanailova, um, who is a journalist and has done a lot of amazing reporting on uh, uh, Chechnya, uh, among other political topics, um, and she writes poetry about these subjects, and these are lines um, in which she reflects on this problem of audience. Um, 
I, if, if people are interested in more context, I'm happy to give it to you, but I'll just go ahead and read the last lines. I read an anti-Putin ditty at a festival sponsored by his administration. The pure wave of icy hatred that rushed at me from the audience, students from provincial theater institutes, was more than I had felt in a lifetime. That's a useful experiment. And uh, the Pussy Riot action, I think, also was a useful experiment. You learn a lot about the uh, challenge of even creating a dialogue um, with uh, between critics and uh, proponents of this regime in Russia today. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just wonder if you think that this is going anywhere. Uh, it seems to me that in Russia, uh, Putin and the uh, oligarchy, the kleptocracy, including the church, have consolidated power very forcefully. And there's nothing, at least that I can see, that indicates this is going to change. Um, and around the world, in China and Turkey and you know several other countries, a similar phenomenon seems to be taking place. Um, this could go on for <laughs> for a long, long time. I mean, is there is there any thought that this is going to change? And why won't we be sitting here 20, 30 years from now with exactly the same thing? <laughs> well, go ahead, please. <laughs> Bill Talman is more qualified to answer that question. I, one thing I would well, say. Well, I don't think any of us have a clue, right. so everybody can answer it. Well, all I, all I can say is that no one in my field, is this true, Bill, really expected the Soviet Union to collapse when it did. Um, nobody expected that we would be here in the 21st century with a new Cold War, so called. So I just think with Tolstoy that many, many small acts flow into the creation <coughs> of historical events. And uh, we may be surprised. I mean, one thing is oil. I mean, one of the things that brought down the Soviet Union, right, was economic. And if, if oil, that situation is going to change. Oh, yeah, for the worse. Um, the well, population is going to shrink and, and, and fossil fuels are going to become less and less relevant. Well, let's, ho let's hope. I mean, it also yeah. can get worse, of course, because it will give him more economic power because of their oil reserves. But we'll see. I don't know. We're washing oil in the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, why on earth did they have a public trial? Was it a gamble to try to present these folk, Pussy Riot, as a, um, you know, here's how bad they are and miscalculate, or is it, um, you know, why on earth you know, do we get these transcripts? Um, well, you, you do get trials in the, uh, in the Russian system. I think what happened was they uh, they immediately had so many foreign supporters that everyone, people were all over this. And they went in and made sure that the entire procedure was documented. And by the way, this also happened during the Soviet era when dissidents were tried. People would make their way into the courtroom, write down secretly, Okay. Um, the proceedings and then distribute them underground. So it's really hard to control information generally, uh, even even in the Soviet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so this is a question of ignorance from somebody who's not a Russian scholar. So everybody else in the room can correct me or add <laughs> to this. But you know, the Russian uh, society recently has been pretty famous for the fact that women seem to be ascendant in the professional classes and men have had tremendous trouble with alcoholism, with other things, uh, and not, not as ascendant, uh, at least 
This may be true in the 1990s. What's happened since then, I'm not sure. But in that kind of context where women have uh, some ascendancy, how do you jive that with this, which is just a complete vacuum? You know, women don't seemingly exist politically in the power structure. They're invisible. Um, how does that happen? That's a great question. And that has to do somewhat with the history of feminism in, in the Soviet era. Um, but especially with this pivotal event of World War II, as has been mentioned, that it, some of, uh, the, in, in early Soviet culture, feminism was actually a uh, part of the platform, the Bolshevik platform. Um, but pretty quickly, um, already certainly in the Stalin era, that's shifting. Um, that doesn't mean women aren't in the workplace, but it means that there's no, uh, there's no sort of feminist values being promulgated. It's simply that women are uh, part of the drive to industrialize, right? They are useful labor for the economy. But culturally, I think it was still, even in the Soviet period, a pretty patriarchal situation. In the 90s, you know, unique economic crises, again, everyone, everyone has to, is scrambling to try to survive. Um, what I was going to say about World War II is you have a demographic situation there where ma many, many men die out. So you, in a sense, have a woman's society. Does that mean that it's a feminist society? Not necessarily. It's a complicated. <coughs> and, and Russian women generally are very wary of um, uh, claiming any kind of feminism. Um, and that, I think that remains the case, except in these pockets of the creative intelligentsia. The Russian church, as Kathy said, remains exceptionally patriarchal. Its leadership by design is entirely <coughs> um, One can only be a, a bishop or a metropolitan or a patriarch if one is male. I, I would say in the larger Orthodox world, there are very tentative, very nascent discussions about allowing women to play a greater role at some international Orthodox conferences. You occasionally get some Greek delegates who will very carefully touch on the question of Christ's maleness. You know, should we emphasize Christ's maleness or should we emphasize the fact that Christ allows God to transform us in the, to the degree that gender may no longer be better? <coughs> but these arguments are largely coming from other Orthodox churches. You, you just don't see it in the Russian Orthodox so I was sort of taken by a bit of a contrast in the two talks between the, the statement that the members of Pussy Riot gave to the court that orthodox culture could ally, its, uh, ally itself with civic rebellion, and then the statistics in the previous talk about, you know, although maybe uh, there are many that identify themselves as being part of an orthodox culture, the awareness of what constitutes an orthodox culture is seriously lagging behind that. Um, and so with the religious motivation of the, or the religious background of the performance that Pussy Riot gave, I'm wondering who is the intended audience there? Is it the Russian culture that is sort of, Russian Orthodox culture that is actively redefining itself? Is it the, the sort of populace that's having this new awakening to the orthodox culture that was suppressed for so long? Or is it, are they speaking to the church directly? Could you I, just speak at the microphone? Yeah, I, uh, I suspect that the, their, uh, the way they spoke about their action evolved somewhat in the course of their uh, detention and trial. I think initially it was very clearly a political action directed against Gundyayev, the patriarch, and Putin. And it was about the elections. And it was about the church openly coming out and telling parishioners, vote for Putin. But I think that they also have a broader cultural agenda that they, and, and you, you see them very uh, early on in their defenses, both public and at, at the trial, um, appealing to Orthodox believers, saying, look, the Orthodox Church belongs to us too, and it belongs to you. And they're trying to um, import these different kinds of values. Um, 
that, that they list in, the, uh, in that statement. Um, that are, however, coded culturally as Western values. So I think ultimately what we're talking about is nationalism. And I think that's what Bryn's statistics tell you. It's not so much about a doctrinal faith. It's about an identity. It's about being Russian. And that's why I think, sadly, these dialogues can't happen. Because um, the, these values, Western, Western values that Pussy Riot is trying to disseminate, simply are regarded as alien to the, the culture and the nature of the Russian people. Thank you. Just a, a comment, a little different perspective on, on Pussy Riot, perhaps. Um, when the act happened, Mr. Putin had already made his pivot to nationalism um, when, you know, for the most part, for the first two terms he was president, it was uh, economic growth and prosperity, which con uh, contributed mainly to his popularity. And when they did that, my thought was, oh my God, if Putin, if Putin could have, should have created them, it was perfect. They played right into his hands politically. It was extremely counterproductive in my view on the part and the way it could be, and it, this wouldn't only, have, you wouldn't have this reaction only in Russia. I mean, imagine some group does the same thing in St. Peter's uh, in Rome, or even someone does this. I mean, it was very, very offensive to the majority of the population, and to do it, it's desacralization of something that, you know, many, many people believed in, whether the depth of their belief or how much they understood about their belief is, is a little bit immat immaterial. So, um, <laughs> I thought, you know, I think they're a, they're a FSB plot. No, so, well, Russian, Russian security forces, because it played so beautifully for them. And you know, it's one thing to, to make, if you want to have a dialogue with somebody, I mean, if you really want to have a dialogue, this is not the way to do it. I mean, to you know, just completely trash the person and the people that you want to have the dialogue with, is it? I think, I think that that's right, that it um, backfired. And it's sort of related to what I was saying about, you know, you can't, you can't have a conversation on these terms, but you're making the point that the sheer offensiveness of the act uh, is counterproductive. Yes. But I think... Um, if, they're, if, they're trying, if they're trying to protest against the, the patriarch, uh, if they're trying to protest against Putin, I mean, I think it's completely counter, counter, counterproductive. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we're here in Amherst College in Massachusetts in 2018 talking about it. Um, I think that I can't imagine a more powerful way to go at the heart of uh, Symphonia. And so while it did, I think, strengthen Putin's hand, I think you're absolutely right. I think their agenda is, let's say, longer term, ultimately. They are trying to represent values that they wish could be a part of the uh, evolution of Russian society into the future. Um, they lost a battle, but I personally find it admirable that they're still fighting the war. Yeah. I, I have a question about uh, the, the turn to orthodox religion and to what extent it might have been influenced to counter uh, the, the, the Muslim religion uh, in some of the uh, uh, Russian populations. Hmm. Boy, I, I can't answer that directly. I, I can try to come at it indirectly. Um, the, the Russian patriarchate clearly feels tremendously in, threatened by other confessions, particularly other Christian confessions. Um, was it 2012 when the foreign agents law was passed? 
which is um, which really prohibits any type of proselytization within Russia outside of churches. This this includes even homes. One cannot proselytize in one's home, which effectively shuts down house churches. This took a particular toll on, on home Pentecostal churches. Um, you can imagine what a law like this does to the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. Um, you, you cannot proselytize online. Um, and the, the church was directly behind this law. So, so certainly there is a sense within the Russian Orthodox Church that Russia, that the church needs the st state to protect it from these other threats. Um, groups that had been quite successful in the early years of the post-Soviet period of proselytizing. Whether the degree to which any of this is a reaction against uh, Muslim groups in Russia, I, that's way beyond my expertise. It's a great question, but I, I can't answer it. question is about, I guess, like, the, for the patriarch Kirill specifically, mm -hmm. and, like, because he is not the first patriarch during the Putin's reign that, because, like, he was preceded by Patriarch Alexei, yeah. and so, kind of, my question is, when was, what was the impetus for, like, the closer collaboration between the Orthodox Church and, Rus and the Russian government? So, is this more Kirill's idea, or is this more something that just happened as like a Sputin entered power, mm -hmm. or is that something that the church tried with Yeltsin but just wasn't as successful? Yeah. That's a great question. You know, in a, in a sense, one could argue that cooperation between the Russian church and the Russian government is not new at all. We can trace it back certainly as far back to 1721 when Peter the Great made the church essentially a cabinet position of the government. Um, so up until the revolution, the, the government controlled the church. There was very close cooperation there. Certainly during the Soviet era, there was a, a different form of very close cooperation. The church was utterly controlled by the state. Um, first persecuted for two decades, then under Stalin um, controlled. Stalin reinstituted the patriarchate, but the patriarchate was on the thumb throughout Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Um, whatever church activity was done was done only with the explicit sanction of the state. So, so what is new in the post-Soviet era is not close ties between the church, but I would say it's an attempt to reintroduce this notion of symphonia, that, that there is cooperation rather than control. This is what Kirill wants, cooperation and protection without full control. But this is a very difficult dance to do. And I think he is in constant tension between wanting the protection of the state, the services of the state, the funding of the state, the legislation that only the state can provide, while not becoming subject fully to the state. <laughs> 